welcome to this webinar um, for this MOOC. My name is Molly Ingersoll. I'm your community manager. I've been answering your questions when I can or uh, passing them on to people who know better when I can't. Um, and I'd just like to say that this is the moment here today to ask any more questions you might have um, while you have us here in front of you. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to the two course organizers, uh, Jean-Marc and Danielle, and I will let them introduce themselves and say a few words before we get started. In the meantime, if you want to put your questions into the chat, we'll get ready to go. Jean-Marc, do you want to start? Okay, good afternoon, uh, good morning, depending where you are on the planet. Uh, I'm Jean-Marc Cavaillon and uh, a retired professor at the Institut Pasteur. And presently I'm in charge of the Agence Nationale de la Recherche, which is the, the funding uh, agency. I'm in charge of uh, topics like COVID-19, infectious disease uh, and antibiotic resistance. And I've been involved in teaching uh, for many years, not only in France, but uh, abroad uh, and a lot with, with Daniel that uh, led him to introduce himself. Hi, I am Daniel, I still working in Pasteur. <laughs> I am not retired. <laughs> I'm not retired yet. <laughs> Uh, I work in Pasteur in, in 1880 and viral infection. I have a lot of work uh, with a cohort of patients in the uh, Pasteur network in Africa, Asia, Latin America. All right. So to get us started, we looked through the discussions and we actually found a few questions that hadn't been answered yet. And I think what we can do is start with those questions while you think of any more questions you might have. And again, when you have a question, feel free to just put it in the chat. Maybe uh, Jean-Marc, do you wanna start with a question about macrophages? Which one is it? Because uh, I, oh. I, I have... Uh... Yeah. On macrophages, are oh, you mean with the acetylcholine? Yes. Okay. So I will share my screen because I think it's easier to answer um, with a, a scheme. Nice. Uh, could you please ch first uh, mention the question you are answering? What do you see on your screen? Maybe nothing. I can read the question as long yeah, as Yeah, because I'm... nowadays uh, I don't have it anymore on my screen. I have it. I can read it. Okay, read it and I, I will uh, show the, 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 the figure. All right, this is everyone's chance to hear my French accent. Je rentre son nom dans le sujet. Pouvez-vous m'apporter des précisions sur l'action de acetylcholine sur les macrophages? Est-ce qu'un incident par voie orale, injectable ou en expérimental sur des cellules? Okay, so the, uh, I will provide you with this cartoon uh, to explain how acetylcholine is involved in controlling inflammation. So first, you have an inflammatory focus, which can be a steroid in cells or because of pathogens. And then, of course, the key issue is the production of cytokines. And those will act on afferent vagus nerve toward the brain. And within the brain, a new signal will be delivered by the efferent vagus nerve that will reach the celiac ganglion. And there, acetylcholine will be produced and will act on the adrenergic splenic neurons that are close to, to, to the spleen. Within the spleen, uh, the, uh, these neurons will release norepinephrine. And norepinephrine will act on the beta-2 adrenergic receptors uh, on T cells. And on its turn, those T cells will produce again acetylcholine within the spleen. And acetyl acetylcholine will act through the alpha-7 nicotinic receptors to turn off the activation of the macrophages and the production of the inflammatory cytokine production. So this is just illustrated how acetylcholine is working as a neuromediator but most interestingly, also here as a, as a product of an immune cell. And as you can see here that these T cells as 
a beta-2 adrenergic receptor able to respond to norepinephrine and is able to, at the turn, to produce acetylcholine. So I think this is very important that the, 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 there is nearly, nearly no border between the immune system and the neuronal system and, and systemic and, and central neural system. So this is the way uh, acetylcholine is uh, acting and turning off the inflammation. So uh, just to, to, to answer the question, it has nothing to deal with uh, the, the providing uh, acetylcholine uh, per or as, as a drug. It's just really uh, how locally uh, it, it's acting. All right, that was very clear. Thank you for demonstrating with the slide. I think that was quite helpful. Let's move on to our second question. Let me just see if I can do a quick, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. let's see if I can translate this quickly for us so we can have it in both. So the second one is about natural killer T cells. I think that Daniel is gonna ask us this. So in French, les lymphocytes natural killer invariants sont-ils détectables sur le sang per fric et si oui, quel est le phenotype CD45 plus, CD3 plus, CD161 plus? Uh, exprimer the CD4, the CD8, the CD16, the CD56. Put on these etudier on cytometry on flu. Um, the Lucians or the lymphons uh, pourrait il en être issu ou du moins nime leur phenotype? And in English, which I'm much better at, yes, no, uh, no, are, okay. are, are invariant natural key cells detectable in the peripheral blood? And what's their phenotype? Are they CD45, CD3, CD61? Do they have CD4, CD8, CD16, or CD56? Can they be studied by flow cytometry? And can leukemias or lymphomas be derived from them or at least mimic their phenotypes? Okay, Daniel, yes, I guess for you. Yeah, thank you. I try to share my screen. Also, uh, uh, it's okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, you have different population of of NK T cells. You have firstly invariant NK T cells. After you have non-invariant NK T cells. Uh, NK T like cells. Uh, in the question, you talk about the invariant NK T cells. And this uh, cell are characterized in human, I thought in humans, in human, but the invariant chain D alpha 24 and Johnson alpha 18 chain. Uh, concerning the CD4, CD8 uh, markers, uh, Invariant NK T cells are CD4 positive, double negative, CD4 negative, CD8 negative. And one population is CD8 that also expresses CD161. All of these cells are uh, coming from uh, bone marrow cells and they uh, express CD45 markers. Uh, you can detect by cytometry, and you can detect them in peripheral blood. Um, this is a minor population among T cells in, in blood. It's less than one person of the total T cells, but you can easily detect uh, the NK T, uh, invariant NK T cell in blood. Uh, concern the markers they, because NK T cells are defined because they share some markers with NK cells. Uh, for this, the NK T cells express uh, CD56 marker, but not CD16 markers. All right, that is great. 
Uh, we have another question here on a little bit more of a, a current topic. Um, let's see here. The question is, how much control do we have regarding the autoimmune system and multiple vaccinations against COVID? Um, essentially, would it be right to assume that the more we get vaccinated, the more likely we are to develop an autoimmune response? And if so, I'd like to understand why that wouldn't be the same with just a flu. So who will to answer that question? Danielle, you wish, or I start and you can continue? Uh, yes, you can, you can start. Okay. I, I think one thing we really need to address is the fact that some vaccines are uh, associating adjuvants. And when you add adjuvants, you in fact address a large uh, panel of cells, you activate a large panel of cells, including of, of course those which will be devoted to the specific immune response to the vaccine. And in fact, it's well known that when you use a vaccine, you also boost uh, other uh, immune response that uh, are uh, because of the use of adjuvants. Now, of course, it depends on the vaccines and some vaccines don't use a very strong adjuvants. And for example, the mRNA vaccine for COVID-19 is uh, not a very strong adjuvant. It's an adjuvant by itself by the, the liposomes, but it's not very strong adjuvant. And most probably uh, that will not occur. But another example is the use of BCG and Molly will love to talk about it. <laughs> but of course, when you use BCG, for example, you boost a lot of uh, immune response widely, not only specific to, to the tuberculosis. And uh, uh, for example, the, the use of BCG has been proposed to boost the immune response for the COVID-19 uh, vaccination or for the COVID-19 patients. So in fact, it's really depending on, on the nature of the vaccines and uh, some may if indeed boost widely the immune system. Now, of course, if, and this is dependent from one individual to another, I, I will say it's a kind of uh, genetically de determined uh, process that people may uh, have also reactivation of O2 antibodies. And indeed, it's known for a very long time that non-specific activation of the immune system will also boost some auto-reactive clones. And then indeed, it may uh, indeed also favor the, the occurrence of auto antibodies or autoimmunity. Danielle, you wish to add something? Um, no, it's okay. Only to remember that inflammation is very important to induce immune response against uh, vaccination. And this is a, a role of the adjuvants in the case of uh, any, any kind of vaccination, actually. Yeah, by, by the way, just uh, it's a discovery which was made at the Institut Pasteur by Gaston Ramon in 1926 when he showed that, in fact, uh, he discovered that the horses, which were making antibodies against uh, diphtheria, uh, had a higher response. And when on the site of injection, there was an inflammatory reaction. And on purpose, he, he created uh, an inflammation uh, within, within vaccination. And uh, he, he used different type of uh, adjuvant. And, uh, that's how uh, the, the adjuvant were, were discovered. The, his favored adjuvant was tapioca. Uh, of course, that is not used anymore, but uh, that's the, the one he, he was favoring. And just for an additional historical note, uh, Ramon, the, the guy who discovered the, the adjuvant, he also discovered the anatoxin, the vaccination against uh, the toxin of diphtheria and is the uh, number one in terms of scientists who were nominated for the Nobel Prize with 150 nomination and is number one. He never got the Nobel Prize. And by the way, the number two in nomination for Nobel Prize who never got the Nobel Prize is also a guy from Pasteur, is Emile Roux, who is 115 nomination. All right, I'm looking in the chat for some questions. I'm still waiting for some questions to come in, but I have a question. Jean-Marc, what you've done is you have 
you really tapped into one of my favorite things about science, which is a little bit of history of science. So I'm wondering if you can tell us what your own favorite discovery is from, from Institute Pasteur. <laughs> well, I have a bias because my favorite scientist is Elie Meshnikov. And uh, so I know that Institute Pasteur is celebrating the 200th anniversary of the birth of Louis Pasteur. But clearly, Pasteur is not my favorite scientist because uh, in terms of human being, uh, he was not a lovely person. But, uh, and especially for women, I mean, he, he was, when he was the, uh, at the head of the university in Lille, he asked the rector to avoid to have any woman attending the science uh, lectures. So he was, and saying that the level will be decreased if women attend uh, the, the course. So I cannot favor that kind of, of behavior. And so my favorite scientist is for sure Mechnikov because not only he was a scientist, but he was a philosopher trying to understand the, the meaning of life. And uh, also his own life was just amazing in terms of uh, being very pessimistic. He attempted to kill himself twice when he was young. Uh, once after the death of his first uh, wife uh, in Madère, she had tuberculosis and he attempted to kill himself with uh, sw uh, swallowing um, morphine, the hair his wife was using. And the second time he attempted to kill himself after his second wife got a typhoid fever. Fortunately, each time he fell and uh, and I mean, he, why I, I love him is that because he not only discovered phagocytosis, of course, that's a key issue in innate immunity, but he also discovered the role of microbiota and was convinced of, of, the, of the role of microbiota on, on aging. And also, uh, so he discovered a lot of um, phagocytic cells. He discovered, I mean, we talk about the, the COVID-19 and he discovered the um, alveolar macrophages. Uh, he discovered the microglial cells within the brain. So he discovered a lot. And uh, I, I just wrote a, a paper about Mechnikov revisiting uh, his work with the COVID-19. And I realized how much, despite he's known as the father of cellular immunity, how much he favored his colleague to work on humoral immunity. And don't forget that Jules Bordet, who got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the complement system, did his work in Mechnikov laboratory. And Mechnikov himself has been working hard to get vaccines and uh, develop animal models, particularly the chimpanzee, to uh, favor the different vaccines. So, and, and finally, about the uh, last two words, two key words about yeah, the two work. words because now we're getting some questions, huh? <laughs> One is probiotic. He, uh, he favored the use of probiotic and created the word gerontology uh, in his. Uh, that's it. Sorry. I have to agree. I, I could. I, I've read your 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 uh, your paper on Meshnikov, and I, I have to say, I he's one of my favorites as well. So we have some questions now coming in. Thank you. The first one is: Can you please explain the relationship between the RNA COVID vaccine and myocarditis in young adults? Uh, it's for uh, Mark. No, it's for a medical doctor. I'm not a medical <laughs> doctor. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you know more than me, the RN is history. Uh, in, but can you repeat the question, please? Uh, sure. Molly? Yeah, what's the relationship between the, the RNA COVID vaccine and myocarditis that particularly arises in young adults? I might add to that, is that an autoimmune reaction or is that just an aberrant reaction of the, of the vaccine itself? Yes. You have to make the difference between the uh, secondary side effects of the vaccine related, for example, for the adjuvants, or related by the vaccine itself. But uh, also, you have to remember that uh, in the during the vaccination, we try to mimic the infection of the or, or the disease 
that means the, the uh, peptides or the protein used during vaccination can mimic the infection by the virus. And this could be uh, give the side effects of the, of, the, of the vaccine also. For example, for, for example effects in the, the myocarditis in, in the patient is related to the, uh, uh, to the spike protein included in the RNA vaccine. Well, I would like just to add that in fact, the, the existence of myocarditis after vaccination has been more frequent in the vaccine like the, the one uh, used by AstraZeneca, which was the uh, wool, vaccine, wool virus. So probably the mRNA coding just for the spike molecule is very limited in terms of inducing the side effect, whereas the, the wool virus used for vaccination might be more frequent for uh, favoring myocarditis. Sorry, but I, in, the, in the last paper, by the CDC uh, from US, is mm, the myocarditis is more frequently after Pfizer vaccination. Truly. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, okay, we have another question. Is there any strategy with vaccines in terms of composition or something else to increase the involvement of memory T cells and, the ex and essentially extend the benefit of that, those vaccines without having to take booster shots as often? I will start to answer the question and then Daniel can give his own opinion. Uh, personally, I think that uh, um, attending to monitor the vaccination only with antibodies was an error. And in fact, at the very beginning, when the mRNA vaccines were proposed, they were showing that very strong memory B cells and memory T cells were involved, induced by the vaccine. And in fact, what has been monitored during the survey of the vaccinated patients was the antibodies, but not the cellular immunity, which is a long lasting immunity. And I think that in fact, those vaccines are perfect already to favor the occurrence of memory T cells and memory uh, B cells. So I, I'm not sure that, I'm, I'm personally, I don't think that um, addressing antibodies to only monitor the immune response after vaccine was appropriate. And the, uh, the present vaccine are very efficient to induce memory T cells and memory B cells. Molly, da Danielle, do you want to? Uh, I, I, was, I would add a little bit about more about strategy um, because this is something that we work on in our lab. So we are trying to find a way to boost memory by specifically to, um, targeting a certain type of memory immune cell. So we know that um, tissue resident memory T cells enter the bladder and that's the area that we're interested in. And now that we know that they're there and that they provide sufficient protection against multiple infections, we're working on an experimental approach to target them directly. And so in fact, the idea is really to, to almost bypass the naive cells that are there and go right to these tissue, me tissue resident memory T cells and, and, and activate them or get them to form. Um, and there's a, a couple different strategies that have been described for other mucosal tissues um, that involve essentially having the antigen in circulation, but also in, in the location where, where um, the infection occurs. And I think that this is relatively new, but from what I've seen, it works incredibly well in the context of TB vaccination and, and tuberculosis. So we're hoping that it'll work in other mucosal surfaces as well. And this might get around um, you know, sort of this history of, of um, inadequate or failed vaccines, particularly for mucosal tissues. I, I went across the paper saying exactly what you said about the lungs yeah. and showing that the T cells induced by the mRNA vaccine for a spike uh, were in fact recovered within the lungs. So yeah. that this is just illustrating once again that this, uh, uh, this cellular immunity is important and exists after the vaccination. Absolutely. Okay, let me see. There's another 
question here. Um, in sepsis, this is definitely for you, Jean-Marc. In sepsis, why is there a shift in a recruitment of immature neutrophils into the circulation? Is it considered a diagnostic criterion? Yeah. Well, why? I will say it's because of what is called the emergency hematopoiesis, which means that because of the very severe infection, the bone marrow is uh, requested to produce more and more cells to defend ourselves against a very severe infection. And as a consequence, uh, we, uh, of course, there is a high, huge boosting production of, of neutrophils and a large number of immature neutrophils are released within the bloodstream. And yes, indeed, uh, they have been shown to, to be a, a diagnosis marker. Right. Um, oh, another question. So should we look at mucosal immunity as, for example, intranasal administration and compare with intramuscular to see if a mucosal Im immunity might prove to be different or complementary? So that's exactly what we're talking about. That's been done. And it's, it's really quite interesting that you can get different levels of protection. And certainly in animal models, you can get different um, uh, types of memory and you can get different uh, degrees of protection against the same disease. If you wanna to add to that. Just one, adding one thing, there is a, a work from the Institut Pasteur where they showed that the intramuscular uh, vaccination was inducing, depending on, upon the donors or the receivers, in fact, uh, the, uh, for some of them, uh, the, uh, the antibodies were found uh, within the, the mucosal area, where others, it was not the case. So uh, one thing is, it's important is to realize we are not equal in terms of our immune system. And this may explain discrepancy from individual to individuals. And uh, that some may, in fact, just by the uh, intramuscular vaccination, have a protection within the mucosa, whereas others may not. And of course, the mucosal vaccine will be a great uh, help to boost uh, locally uh, the immune system. That's, uh, sorry, but my problem is polio, polio vaccine, because you have two different uh, vaccines to polio and you have uh, injection, intramuscular injection, and the other one is mucosal. Mm -hmm. And you have the same kind of protection against oh. polio. All right, now we have another um, question that is, boosting the immune system is the better vaccine, I believe that. What do you think about that? essentially stimulating the immune response is what's going to give us the best vaccine. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really the, I think that's really the point. Well, I, I already mentioned about the BCG, like mm -hmm. is used to boost the immune system. Um, they were, especially in France, a uh, long time ago, 20, 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago, they were drugs that were given to children and mothers love those drugs because it was boosting their immune system. It was non-specifically boosting the immune system. And during the winter time, the mother were very happy and maybe the father as well, because their kids were um, without any uh, flu and other disease during the winter time. However, all those drugs, uh, which were an awful mixture of products, of bacterial products, uh, uh, mainly containing endotoxin, in fact, uh, were re or withdrawn from the market uh, because, of course, it was uh, boosting everything and not specifically. And again, we are back to the, the, the role of the adjuvant uh, in terms of vaccination, because if you boost too widely the immune system, then, of course, you may boost as well the autoimmune re reactive clones, which you don't wish to do. Great. Okay, so now we have a question about the microbiota. Do we think that the intestinal microbiota status plays a role in the um, uh, immune, re re immune response to a vaccine?
I, uh, I'm going to say yes, because <laughs> I'm going to say yes, because we know that the microbiota in general, and if we think beyond just the gut, but we think about the skin, we think about the nasal passages, we can think about the lung, we can think about the bladder, all of those we know can impact a number of different um, uh, responses in, in humans and in other animals. So I think that it's possible that our intestinal microbiota status does play a role in how we respond to vaccines. I mean, it probably plays a role in how we respond to infections as well. Um, but I don't think I've seen anything that's um, definitively shown certain status gives us a better or a worse response. Uh, all right, here's another question. Um, Pouvez m'expliquer pourquoi on contracte le COVID après s'être vacciné? Why do we still get COVID after we've been vaccinated? Well, I think it's true, especially for the new variant, the Omicron variant, because the uh, vaccination has been addressing the very first variant. And there was a good cross reactivity between the alpha, beta, and delta. Uh, uh, variants, which was not that much the case for the Omicron. So that uh, explained that despite vaccination, people could get, uh, uh, could be sick after the Omicron. Of course, uh, despite of that, they still have a T cell immunity, which is far more cross reacting. So uh, the vaccination uh, allow them not to go in an intensive care units. They are sick, but they are not de dealing with a very severe disorder just because in fact, part of the immunity is still there, especially the T cell immunity. But it's probably because the, the cross reactivity at the antibody levels is not that good uh, for, for that protection. I think you make a great point though that these vaccines are keeping keeping us out of intensive care and keeping us away from severe disease and keeping us away from um, fatal infection. All right, here we go. How do we explain the low effectiveness of certain antiparasitic vaccines, particularly the vaccines against canine leishmaniasis? <laughs> Okay, you find that funny, Danielle. So just answer the question. Go for it, Daniel. No, <laughs> no the, the, the problem is, uh, is uh, the, the parasites are uh, complicated in the point of view the antigens. There is more antigens than the, in the parasites than the viruses. And, you know, for example, the, the vaccination against bacteria is against toxin or is not against the whole bacteria. And this is a problem in the parasite. And the parasite uh, are many, many antigens. This antigen can evade the immune response in the host. All right, I don't miss. I will just make a quick note here if anyone has any more sort of technical or administrative questions just let us know I can put an email address in the chat to let you know if you have some specific questions about that let me know um let's see what do we have here I think there was a question about th17 no Yes, in the in the first in the chat in the first question in the chat. In the chat, T seventeen. Yes. yes. I don't see it. Uh, maybe it was before you arrived, but it, oh, it's one, two, three. Four, is, it, is it one question about CD forty five on in case of? and the other? Yes. Uh, and the other question is about TH17. Yes. Yeah.
Well, just to, do you see my screen? We do. Okay, fine. Just to answer the question about TH17, because in fact, of course, uh, the, the question was re related to, to the fact that uh, 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 TH17 are not the only cells capable to produce IL-17. And this is a, a slide which is already not accurate anymore because you see that T cell, CD4, gamma data, innate lymphoid cells, and KT cells, and CD8 are able to produce IL-17. And in fact, you can add um, neutrophils that can also produce um, can also produce uh, IL-17. So IL-17 is produced by a large number of uh, immune cells. All right, um, let me see. We have one, lipid nanoparticles. Yeah, here we go. Lipid nanoparticles have shown great results for COVID-19 vaccines, but are there any benefits of developing non-lipid uh, delivery systems such as polymeric or hybrid lipid and polymeric nanoparticles develop vaccines that would trigger a different type of immune response? Well, I, I'm not very sure I can appropriately answer the question, but what is clear is that Catalin Carico, she has been working for more than 20 years to find the best way to deliver the mRNA uh, and uh, the, in fact, even 30 years ago, the, 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 nano, the, the, the lipid nanoparticles uh, have been used. And I think they, they, they really tried hard to find which way will be the most appropriate to deliver and protect, because the most important is to protect the mRNA, which is, will be de degraded too rapidly if injected as such. So probably may, maybe other, um, nanoparticles could be used, but they, they, there was a great effort already to find the most appropriate ones. And in fact, it's kind of a uh, of technical secret between Pfizer and, uh, and uh, Moderna, and they, they have some differences in terms of uh, building those lipid nanoparticles. So maybe others could, be, uh, could do the job, but uh, when I got in touch with uh, Catalin Carico, she explained me also that the advantage of these sleeping nanoparticles were that they, they were adding by themselves a little uh, role of adjuvant. So this is, uh, I, I don't know what other constructs have been proposed, but I know they have been hard, working hard to, to, to find the, the, this best appropriate uh, way to deliver the mRNA. What's quite interesting is kind of going the other way. Um, lipid nanoparticles and mRNA vaccines are now um, in, in development for non-infectious diseases, for, for cancer, for example, um, which I think is a, a really wonderful outcome of this, this push we made with this particular vaccine. All right, here's another question. I would like to know how NK cells can enhance a viral infection. Yes. Um, uh, Daniel, can I ask you, we have a couple comments in the chat. It's hard to understand you. Are you in a place where you can take your mask off or not? Sorry? It's, it, uh, there are a couple comments that say it's hard to understand you with your mask. And I wanted to ask only if you're in a place where you can take your mask off. The rule as oh. a professor is you must have your mask on if there's people around. Because I, I have another people in my lab. Okay, yeah. But so, sorry I about can. that. I can. It's not, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, in case of have different mechanisms to enhance uh, viral infection. What is the most important is to kill uh, T cell effector cells. That is very well demonstrated during HIV infection. NK cell uh, can kill CD4 and CD8 uh, T cells. Uh, in this case, 
uh, in case cell can avoid the generation of T cell immune response. All right. All right. So now there's someone who's reading their literature. They ask about a new paper that reports that MBL innate receptor has a high affinity for the S protein in COVID-19. Could that be the primary reason why some people have never had COVID, even if they had a long contact with an infected person? Or do you think that might not be sufficient enough for that, for that scenario? Uh, I don't know why. Yeah. Well, it's a work, I just came to, to I, I didn't know this, this work. It's a work of Cecilia Garlanda. She's teaching in our, in our course. And uh, I, so I don't know this, this paper, I, I will read it. To, to my point of view, but I mean, we, we can discuss that. The, 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 the fact that other part of the virus can be recognized by other receptors is just, I will say, expected because, of course, some, for example, the, the TLRs, uh, the, the toll like receptors, are also involved in the recognition of, of the SARS CoV 2 uh, virus. So there are plenty of, of ways our immune system is recognizing different um, components of, of the virus. Now, if it can explain the discrepancy from people to people, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, the, the, there is clearly uh, people that uh, have been exposed there. Uh, they live with someone who got the, 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 the COVID and uh, they never got COVID-19. I will say that for sure, there is, we are just rediscovering that we are not equal in turn in our immune system and there are predisposals and as well, I guess, some protection, mechanism of protection. I'm not sure that discrepancy between uh, all of us in terms of manus binding lectin may explain the discrepancy from uh, uh, resistant to, non to sensitive uh, people. I've, I don't know. Danielle, what's your feeling? The point with these uh, kinds of receptor lectin, or uh, they can bind uh, non non specific several patterns. Um, maybe I don't know. I don't know. All right, we have another question. Can you please explain the role of IL-4 during the inflammatory process? Daniela, I do, and you then you continue. Yes, <laughs> because it's your, uh, it's your field. Well, um, I will say it depends which type of inflammation we are dealing with. If it's an allergic inflammation, then IL-4 is a key actor in this uh, inflammatory response. In contrast, if it's uh, inflammation during bacterial infection, for example, I would say that IL-4 is rather a down-regulating cytokine. It's, it's so-called because it's not that, the dichotomy is not that clear, but it's more an anti-inflammatory cytokine like IL-13 or like IL-10 or like interferon alpha. So they, they will rather limit the inflammatory reaction. But again, uh, depending on what type of inflammation we are dealing with. Uh, also, if you talk about chronic or acute inflammation, it's different. Yeah. Mm. So just to illustrate what I am saying, it's just to say that uh, 20 years ago, I wrote a paper called Pro versus anti-inflammatory cytokine myth or reality. And uh, I think this paper is 20 years old. Uh, but it, its peak of citation was last year. <laughs> and I think this, this illustrates that uh, this oversimplistic view of inflammatory cytokines or anti-inflammatory cytokine is not appropriate. And it depends on many other environmental 
uh, element factors that can modulate and they are now there is plenty of paper showing that IL-10 can be a pro-inflammatory cytokine, TNF can be an anti-inflammatory cytokine. Mm -hmm. So depending upon the model, the situation, the timing, whatever, uh, the, the dichotomy is not that simplistic. All right. So here's another question. Could we speak of memory in innate immunity? Is it restricted to innate behavior in adaptive immune cells? Molly? Uh, I'm, I'm not certain I understand. If the question is, do adaptive immune cells have innate behavior? We could say yes. Um, we see, for example, um, uh, an infiltration of what we would consider to be innate, or uh, I'm sorry, adaptive cells very early in the same window as the innate cell infiltration in some types of infections like in the bladder. Um, but I think when we talk about innate memory, we're really more talking about innate cells having a memory that looks more like an adaptive immune cell, that an innate cell is changed by a first infection so that it responds faster to a second infection, which ultimately goes against the definition of the innate response versus the adaptive response. Only the adaptive cells, only the B cells and the T cells are supposed to remember an infection. But in fact, that paradigm has been fairly shattered, uh, I think it's fair to say. And, and there's certainly good evidence for monocytes and for NK cells, for example, to remember an infection that's already happened. Um, and so I think if we're talking about memory in the community, that's what we're talking about, rather than innate behavior in adaptive cells. But I think you could find examples of adaptive cells looking like they're responding in an innate way, in sort of a, you might call them like a bystander response, if it's a T cell, for example. You want to add to that? Just added a word that may help to understand what is it is. And a word I've been defending a lot is reprogramming. Yes. Which is that in fact, cells have encountered first a first signal and they are reprogrammed. And in fact, I mean, we knew that process a long time ago. It was endotoxin tolerance. And it was exactly the reverse, which means that uh, monocytes were in fact less capable to be activated. So depending on the nature of the first signal, is it BCG or beta-glucan, then the cells are primed or they can be turned off. And I think that's why we, we can use the word reprogramming, just depending upon the, first, the nature of the first signal. Yes. All right, I'm looking in one more place to see if there's any questions that have come. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we have. How is immunity transmitted to the next generation of cells? That's sort of related to what we were just talking about. We, you mean the uh, irritability of uh, innate uh, memory? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, they, there was just a paper that failed to reproduce the, the paper of uh, Mihai Netea showing that it was uh, transmitted to the next generation. So I think the, 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 the question is still open. I agree with that. Um, how about if it's just a stem cell and it's passing on its uh, memory to the cells that it's making? <laughs> through its marks, perhaps? Through its, uh, maybe that through, anyway. Here's another one. Oh, it's a mucus question, my favorite. Is the mucus a mechanical or a chemical barrier. In the test in chapter five, mucus is both mechanical and a chemical barrier. So that's confusing for me. Please, can I have a better explanation? Let me take that. All right. <laughs> we, we love mucus in the lab. So certainly the mucus is 
a, a mechanical or a physical barrier, right? So you can imagine because of its thickness is because of the potential um, cross-linking of the proteins and the sugars that are inside of it, um, it's more difficult for a bacteria or other pathogens to penetrate this, this barrier. And in, um, there's very old experiments that show if the mucus is um, stripped away, then that organ is more um, susceptible to infection. Is it a chemical barrier? I think we need to think about that in terms of what is in that mucus as well, right? So if you have a mucosal surface, what happens is it's making antimicrobial proteins. So it can be or peptides and it might be making those constitutively or not. It depends on what the peptide is. And then those will potentially be trapped in that mucus. So you can imagine a scenario where you're a bacteria that has an ability to penetrate into that mucus layer. Now you're gonna essentially encounter um, different, uh, different host defenses such as antimicrobial peptides. And so in that sense, I think it would be fair to say that it's both a mechanical and a chemical barrier. Is that anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, please. All right, what else do we have? Let me see, I have one more here. Um, mm -hmm. Let me answer those. Uh, no, no, no. Someone is asking, how do we favor innate immunity? How oh, what? Acting. How do we favor innate immunity? What do you mean by favor? I'm not, I'm not sure what that might mean. Perhaps, well, favoriser, does that help? It's actually written in French. Comment favoriser l'unité innate? <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, it's our favorite innate immunity. It's our favorite field, but uh, um, let me see. But it's it's a prerequisite. So I mean, you cannot have uh, immune response without innate yeah. immunity, and it's most important because, for example, insects don't have adaptive immunity. They just deal with uh, innate immunity. So mm -hmm. this is the key one. All right, I'm putting a question in our chat because it's in Spanish. Oh, uh, you have one in Spanish, Daniel. That's Daniel, right. that is to you. I am I'm not going to destroy the Spanish language. <laughs> it's in our uh, chat. You should be able to see it. What kind of the immune cells has been proposed as immunotherapy in transplantation of progenitor hematopoietic cells? Uh, I don't know that because to uh, no to to transplant normally only uh, stem cells from bone marrow. Yep. So you don't transplant any kind of specific cells, either innate or adaptive immune. All right. Here we have another question that I think is a cool question. I don't know the answer to. Does stomach mucus contain immune cells? Yes. Okay. What is the question? That's the question. Does stomach <laughs> mucus contain immune cells? Does it contain? Yeah. Are there immune cells in the mucus? I think that's a great question. I don't know that there's really immune cells in the mucus in any surface. They're below it typically. They're in the actual epithelium. Yeah. Yeah, they are, they are in the tissues, not outside. Sometimes they stick their little arms out into the mucus. Sample that's been demonstrated beautifully in the gut and uh, to a lesser extent in other surfaces. But- uh, well, Maybe it depends on the, on the mucosa. I mean, in the lungs, you may have cells outside mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the tissues. They're very close to the surface. So in the sure. lungs, for instance- yeah. Yeah, they are maintained to the yeah. surface. All right, we have a clarification on that question about the innate immune response. How can we improve or boost the innate response? 
well, I think we are back to the, what we already addressed about the, the, the BCG or mm -hmm. whatever you can boost the immune system. I mean, but again, it, it, it's take the metro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Taking the metro on their ground I know. every day. <laughs> I think so. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, well, you, you can think about vitamin D, you can think about vitamin C, you can think about oligo elements, you can, whatever the immune system needs to, to work perfectly, you can provide him some uh, good uh, ingredient. Mm -hmm. All right, I got another one for you, Daniel, it's in Spanish. Get ready. Here it comes. Uh, is uh, hmm, I I don't know what's mean. Uh, it's better to clarify the question because I uh, I don't understand the question in, in Spanish. Is it, why is causing? It's, it's uh, about the defects or the deficit of the in. in innate immunity, mm -hmm. but it casually can be. Well, it could be mutations. I mean, you, you can be deficient. For example, you can be deficient in one of the complement uh, elements. You can be deficient in, uh, in some receptors. I mean, the, this just again, genetically uh, predisposed uh, deficiency in one of the key elements of the innate immunity. All right, agreed. I mean, I suppose there could be anything. It could be alleles, it could be, yeah. Uh, let's see, we did our natural killers. We discussed this. Uh, ah. uh, here's another one. I'm not sure that this is a, if this is not, Daniel, I'm not, a science question, we can refer it to. Uh, is uh, I can translate it to Clementine, yeah, because it's about the course. Uh, okay, we can transmit that to. Uh, I... Perfect. And then I thought it might be about the course. All right, let's see. Mm -hmm. All right, we're coming up on the hour. This is, uh, I would say, if anyone has any questions, um, this is the moment to drop them in. Uh, oh, look at that. Uh, can we fight Helicobacter pylori with just the immune system cells? I would say, I mean, essentially you've got Helicobacter pylori, it goes in, it sets itself up in the, in the mucus. And as long as it's sense, as long as it's something knows it's there, then you're gonna have an immune response. That's the, <laughs> that's the best I could say about Helicobacter. Um, I know that certainly it can it colonize and, and, and go undetected. And if it's undetected by the immune response, you, it will stay there, it will colonize that tissue. And I mean, that's really, very generally speaking, the case for, for infections in general. Uh, if they go undetected by the immune response, they can stay. Um, all right. In the case of reprogramming of innate immune cells, is it possible to observe this reprogramming by phenotypic expression using flow cytometry? The short answer will be yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, more detailed answer will be well, probably depending on which marker you can follow. Uh, for example, but that was with a, a funny a, a work we did with a fungal infection, and we showed that the neutrophils after a first infection, the the progenitors 
at different levels of, of expression of certain biomarkers of certain receptors. So I, I will say yes, and I, I think then uh, it depends which uh, receptor can be uh, modulated uh, to uh, illustrate that process. But uh, yes, probably I'm not really aware of specific uh, biomarkers of monocytes that... Uh... Yeah. Yeah. For in case cell, they described some Chemokine receptor combination of the chemokine receptor can, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's no it's not very good markers, you know. Mm -hmm. The population is inside of the combination of the different receptor of chemokine, but the whole population is not only uh, memory and case cells. All right. All right. I see that we have answered all of the questions from the inscription. Thank you, everyone, for putting questions into the inscription. I see that we've answered all of the questions in the chat, and we've answered all of the questions in the Q&A. I think we planned um, one hour today for this. So what I would say is thank you everyone for joining us. I really enjoy seeing that everyone's coming from all over the world. It's really fun. Um, continue to put your questions in the discussion. If I can answer them, I will. And if I cannot, I will find someone who can. Um, and, and certainly uh, enjoy the rest of the course and good luck on the test. Any final words, Jean-Marc or Daniel? Well, thank you, Molly, for uh being our chairwoman for this session. Uh, just to mention that uh, Danielle and I are organizing a face-to-face -face course for three weeks uh, on the topic of innate immunity and infectious disease at the Institut Pasteur, and most probably thanks to the decrease of COVID-19 crisis. I mean, we have the, probably the chance to be uh, in presence of the speakers. We have something like 50 speakers. They are all experts on all the topics that have been addressed uh, with the MOOC. And I will say, if the, the MOOC you have followed was a kind of appetizer uh, for the uh, innate immunity, I think the, the, you, you, and you wish to know more and more precisely and have a new chance to ask questions, then you are more than welcome to apply to this course. The, the, you still have one week for that. You go on, on the website of Institute Pasteur and you will find the, uh, the application form. And uh, we will be most happy to, to welcome you uh, from all over the world uh, for, this, uh, for this course. Fantastic. And just one last note, because I see someone's asked, this whole webinar has been recorded and it absolutely will be available um, uh, associated with the MOOC itself. So if you would like to rewatch it or um, need some clarification, uh, this will be available. All right. Great. I would just like to thank everyone for joining us from all over. I'd like thank to you. say thank you to Daniel Jean-Marc for, uh, thank you, for hanging out with me in this webinar and uh, we'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you, Molly. It was, it was fun. It was great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye everyone. And uh, have a good night or a good day, whatever you are in your country.